Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. For those of you who are new to Dan's programs, we will be taking questions in about 30 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. And our Vice President of Events, Jessica Deganzik, will be taking your questions and managing them uh, when we are in the Q&A portion of today's program. It is now my great pleasure to welcome you to politics in the time of coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. We have three great topics today. The, the K-shaped recovery, Biden pushes for COVID relief. Second, new president, same country, how did Biden do on the world stage? And third, Fox News, MSNBC, and you, how to navigate a changing media landscape. I predict a lot of questions today. <laughs> <laughs> so let me turn this over to you quickly so you can get started. Thank you so much. Well, I think betting on a lot of questions is a safe bet. As you know, Kim, we have a very active and engaged and enthusiastic audience. And so while I'll take some time at the outset to run through those three topics, um, as always, we'll be especially eager to hear what all of you have to say and to contribute uh, once we move from my presentation into the conversation. So, all right, topic A, uh, the K-shaped recovery, Biden pushes for COVID relief. And on last Tuesday, just a few hours after we gathered here, uh, Joe Biden took the first official trip of his presidency uh, to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A few days after that, he flew to Detroit, Michigan. And both of these, as all of you know, were key swing states in the last few presidential elections. And both of these states contain millions of the type of swing voters Biden needs to pass his coronavirus relief package. Now, as we've discussed before, the big ticket here is a $1,400 stimulus check for most working Americans, but it also includes extension of unemployment benefits, money for vaccinations, uh, for state and local government, and for school reopening. One thing it probably won't have, as we've talked about before, is an increase in the minimum wage, at least not at the $15 per hour that Biden uh, level that Biden originally proposed. And we'll talk more about that week as that particular topic comes into, into more focus. But how he handles that challenge specifically over the minimum wage increase is gonna tell us a lot about how the president intends to manage his relationship with progressives in his own party, since they are not happy about this at all. But public support, is very, very solidly with Biden. More than two thirds of voters approve of the bill and even a third of Republicans, according to polling just released this morning, support the way that Biden is handling the virus. Now that's not a broader, that doesn't reflect a broader sense of bipartisanship. Their overall approval ratings of Biden are less than half of that. But the fact that such a larger number of Republicans are supportive suggests so a really broad base of support that Biden has. And he's moving quickly to try to take advantage of it. The House Budget Committee approved the bill yesterday, and the full House is going to vote on it in the next several days, by this weekend in all likelihood. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the Senate hopes to move within the next couple of weeks so that Biden can sign the bill before unemployment benefits begin running out in the middle of March. And barring a big unforeseen problem, this should happen. At least, at least that's what I think. Uh, but Claire, let's find out what our what our group thinks. Um, do you agree? Will uh, a COVID stimulus bill pass Congress? And option one, yes, by next month, in order to be done by the time unemployment benefits begin to run out. Second option, yes, but not until later this year. In other words, the Congress doesn't always move fast, even when it needs to. So this one might take a while. Or third, no, it's not going to pass. So let's see what everybody has to say on this one. Wow, 93%, that's almost unanimous, think it'll pass by that mid-March deadline. And a handful of you say, yeah, it'll take a little bit longer, but still pass. No one believes that a COVID relief bill is not going to pass. And I think you're right about that, given the large and broad base of public support that we see for the bill. 
But let's ask a follow-up question here. And Claire, if we can put the next question up just right away now. So when that bill passes, whether it's in the next couple of weeks or whether it's later this spring, how much Republican support will it get? Uh, a significant amount of support, say more than 10 votes in passage, um, a few Republican votes, just a handful, but no more than that. Or third, no Republican support at all. So once again, let's see what our, our group has to say on this particular topic. Also very interesting. 28%, um, a little bit more than a quarter of you, think that Biden will still pull a decent amount of bipartisan support. Most of you think he'll get a few Republican votes, but it's really just a few, and that's almost two thirds of you. And interesting, only 7%, it's a very small minority, frankly, less than I would have anticipated uh, from all of you, say that he'll get no Republican votes at all. And of course, once the bill passes, even if there's just one single Republican vote, what we've learned from presidents of both parties in the past is as long as they can get even one single member of Congress on the other side to vote for their legislation, then forevermore they can refer to it as passing with bipartisan support. So even if all the Republicans except for just one or two vote no, Biden will be able to say upon signing the bill that it was something that was done on a bipartisan basis. And that from at least a messaging standpoint is a, is a big, big advantage for him. Anyway, so let's assume that that bill passes and it gets signed. Well, well, that was the easy part. Now, Biden has already indicated that he wants to follow up on this relief bill with a much, much bigger and much, much more ambitious economic package. This is his Build Back Better plan. And that legislative package could include job creation, infrastructure, climate change, even immigration reform. And it's clear that while Biden looks at the COVID relief bill as an emergency stopgap measure, he sees Build Back Better as the foundation for a more comprehensive economic agenda going forward. That's the main reason that the White House moved Biden's joint address of Congress from February. It was originally supposed to be this week, but they moved the speech till mid-March. Now, technically, in a president's first year in office, when he gives an inauguration address, he does not also deliver a State of the Union, so it's called simply a joint address to Congress. But for all practical purposes, this is Joe Biden's State of the Union address, and the White House moved it back a month to March because they want to pass the COVID bill first and use the bigger speech to make the case for his broader economic plan. The COVID bill is now being costed at about $1.9 trillion. The next one could be twice that. But in Biden's mind, it's the difference between short-term relief and long-term economic restructuring. And this gets to the question of the K-shaped recovery. You may remember, remember last spring when the politicians and the economists were debating on whether the COVID recession would end with a V-shaped recovery in which the economy came back very quickly or an L-shaped recovery in which the downturn lasted a long period of time. Now, since then, some econom economists have talked about the W-shaped recovery in which we've seen some economic comeback followed by more difficult periods when the virus rears up. But there's spreading agreement that what we'll finally end up with seeing is a K-shaped recovery in which a portion of the electorate does very well economically, while many others continue to suffer job loss and real economic pain. And that's what Biden's Build Back Better plan is designed to address. We're already seeing considerable evidence that most white collar workers, those who can work from home by phone and by laptop, well, they've made it, hmm, we've made it to the last year without taking much of a hit. But for those who have to leave their homes to work or who live in very crowded circumstances, both the health and the jobs impact has been much, much greater and much more dire. So let me try to quantify that. The shakeup to the economy caused by COVID and the impact of the pandemic on the way we live and work means that one out of every 10 American workers will need to find new work in the years ahead. One out of 10 workers by the end of the decade. That's an incredible statistic. Now, I, I know Bill Gates did a phenomenal program uh, that hopefully many of you were able to attend last week. But a few months ago, Gates predicted 
that 30% of what he called days in the office, 30% of days in the office would go away forever. This week, there was a report released from the McKinsey Global Institute, which says that 25% of business travel won't come back and 20% of workers could end up working from home indefinitely. And what that means is fewer jobs at hotels, at restaurants, at downtown stores and shops. And in addition to the ongoing automation of office support roles and factory and warehouse jobs. So retail, food service, healthcare, transportation, the job losses there are already pretty apparent. But the much greater impact could be in the manufacturing sector where factories have been using the pandemic social distancing restrictions to move much more quickly toward automation than would normally be the case. Now, this is in line with historical economic trends. Automation of jobs often speeds up during recessions because companies look to cut costs and they use periods of layoffs to experiment, experiment with new technologies. But many economists predict there could be much more automation now because in addition to the layoffs, the pandemic forced companies to look for ways to minimize the number of employees in a workspace. And the vast scale of the layoffs in the economy gives executives a very unique opportunity to bring in robots and even more automated work. And when the economy comes back and the virus has subsided, there's not gonna be a lot of economic incentive to go back. So I'm gonna frame this uh, to all of you in a question that talks about how this automation and job shifting affects our lives. So here's my question for all of you. What's more important to you? More automation and with it, of course, comes lower prices or preserving jobs. This is something that affects each of us. Automation costs less. It means there's more efficiency in these companies, in, the, in these factories, and that means lower prices for consumers but it also means job loss. Now, some would argue that preserving jobs once technology has passed them by isn't, it uh, uh, shouldn't be a top priority uh, for a society. We still don't have buggy whip factories or factories making eight trap tapes. But on the other hand, the displacement that can come from this job loss to job shift can be considerable. So what do all of you think is more important? Well, this is a close one. This is closer than we normally get on our questions. 45%, not quite half, say that lower prices, therefore more automation, is more important. 55% say preserving existing jobs. So that's a pretty close margin. And so this is a topic we'll talk about again, certainly in the weeks ahead. We've talked in the past about America's changing attitudes towards international trade. One of the reasons that voters have become so skeptical about trade is because the job retraining for, uh, that was supposed to accompany trade deals in the past to help displaced workers learn new skills never happened, at least not to the degree that they were promised. And so not surprisingly, working class voters are much more skeptical toward free trade than they have been in the past because that worker retraining didn't happen. Now this workforce shift this post-COVID uh, automation will be much greater than any job dislocation caused by any trade deal in our country's history. Possibly the biggest workforce shift since the Industrial Revolution. And we need to be ready for it. And it's not clear that it's not clear that we are. Okay, let's move on to our second topic. Let's talk about Biden on the world stage. How did he do? And of course, he's still on the world stage, but last week was his debut. Uh, both in uh, Biden's appearance at the G7 summit and then addressing the widely respected Munich Security Conference, both last Friday. Now, you may remember a few weeks ago, I quoted a European diplomat talking about the Biden administration. And that diplomat said, quote, new president, but same country, unquote, suggesting that many of the populist and isolationist and America first sentiments that we heard from Donald Trump throughout his presidency didn't disappear on Inauguration Day and are still very present in our electorate. So it was instructive to watch Biden on the world stage in his debut last week, because he saw these events as an opportunity to signal America's reascension to a position of international leadership 
Um, he committed the U.S. to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, of course. He pledged billions of dollars for COVID relief to underdeveloped countries. And he pledged to rejoin the Iran nuclear pact. And no one was watching more closely over the course of that day and the days since than Europe's leaders. Because Europe is our traditional ally. European leaders have struggled through the last four years trying to improvise a much different set of relationships under Trump than they'd been used to with American presidents. So they wanted to hear what Biden had to say. Now, to tell you the truth, the bar for Biden was set pretty low. All he really had to do was tell these leaders how important they were to us and that the United States knew how important, knew how important our relationships with their countries were. At the same time that he was talking to the G7 and the Munich conference, his Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, was meeting with the heads of NATO and telling them the same thing. So Biden and Austin, and his entire team, they were flattering as fast as they could. And it worked, but only to a point. Because beyond, beyond the America is back message, slogan that Biden delivered, his most emphatic message at the G7 and the Munich conference were about the threats that China and Russia present to the world order. And while the Europeans were relieved to welcome back a more traditional American partner, it's pretty notable that they were much cooler in their response to Biden's call for them to unite with the US against the menace that he argued is caused by these two countries, Russia and China. Um, the European Union has just signed a very sweeping trade agreement with China. Uh, meanwhile, Germany is leading an effort to complete a transcontinental export gas pipeline with Russia. And French President Emmanuel Macron, who's going to become Europe's most influential leader when German Chancellor Angela Merkel steps down later this year, well, he used his speaking slot at the Munich conference to repeat his, his concept of what he, Macron, calls, quote, a European strategic autonomy. A European strategic autonomy, which reflects a less closely coordinated relationship with the US on defense and other matters. So once again, I'd like to get your assessment on this. Is Biden moves to confront China and Russia, and we saw some moves just this morning that we'll talk about in a minute. The question is, is will Europe support Biden in confronting China and Russia? Or are they still somewhat distrustful given the experience of the last four years? So what do you think? Will they support Biden fully and completely? Second option, will they support Biden to some degree, but not as much as he wants? Or third, will they not really be that supportive because their own, support, their own priorities come first? And the response we got was, hmm, that is one skeptical group we have today. Only 4% believe that Europe will support Biden and the United States fully and completely when it comes to China and Russia. 72%, almost three quarters, say yes, but that should probably read not as much as Biden wants, um, so to some degree. And a quarter say, no, they're not gonna be supportive. Europe's not gonna be supportive. Their own priorities are gonna come first. And that is the longer term price as we've talked about in the past um, of the weakening of the relationships in, in recent years. Now, just this morning, and I alluded to this a minute ago, just this morning, we saw the first steps from the Biden administration in confronting China and Russia. Um, and the European Union's response was instructive. On one hand, the EU signed on in support of sanctions that the United States will impose on Russia over the way, over the way Russia's treated their op the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. It looks like it may have required Biden uh, to give in on that oil pipeline I talked about a minute ago between Russia and Europe in order to get their support. And that's something we'll have to examine more in the weeks ahead once we learn more information. So it looks like when it came to Russia, Europe was on board, but not only because the US is willing to back down on something else, a real import to them. And on China, the Europeans were much more restrained in their support of a emerging US challenge toward China regarding, freedom, uh, regarding uh, freedom and liberties in Hong Kong. So on Russia, very pronounced step uh, 
in support of the US. In China, yeah, a little bit, but not nearly all that much. So, so far, it looks like the majority of you are right in how this is gonna, uh, in how this is gonna proceed. Now, make no mistake about it, Biden needs Europe. He needs Europe to successfully confront China and Russia. But Europe is a lot more wary about America's reliability after the last four years of dealing with a less traditional president. So Biden's pulling out all the tools at his disposal to rebuild this transatlantic relationship. But the question is, how many tools does he have? Um, he can talk a good game on climate change and on trade, but he's limited by domestic challenges, domestic political challenges on both of those fronts. And we've already seen, <coughs> excuse me, we've already seen a flashpoint between the United States and other countries on vaccine distribution, which means, and we'll talk more about this next week, it means that Biden's pledge to fixing the Iran nuclear agreement may be his best way of reassuring nervous European leaders that he can be trusted. Now, I'm not as convinced, I'm not so, con I'm not convinced much at all that the Iran deal is, something, is as much of a priority for Biden as he says it is. And that's something we'll talk about next week when one of our three topics will be Biden in the Middle East. But at least right now, Biden understands that demonstrated eagerness to re-enter that deal is essential, not just for the Middle East, but because of his broader goals for which he very badly needs European support. All right, let's go on to our third topic. And I think this one's gonna be a particularly interesting one because it's a little bit less typical than the types of things we normally talk about. We normally focus on straight on politics and policy. But this question about the new media landscape is a fascinating one and it's an important one. And before I dig in any deeper, let's start out uh, by getting a sense of our group's media habits on this landscape. So tell us the truth. Which of the following networks do you watch most frequently? Is it CNN? Is it MSNBC? Is it Fox News? Is it independent online news like YouTube journalists? Or none? Do you rely more on traditional broadcast and print media than on, than on cable or online sources? So let's see what we got here for our group. Interesting. 39% uh, say CNN, 34% say MSNBC. So you combine those two and you're at almost three quarters of our audience. Only 4% of our group watches Fox News more than the other. 3% uh, relies on YouTube and other uh, online-based journalism. And 20%, um, uh, a fifth of you, rely on more traditional sources for news and information. Or maybe on this webinar, I guess we'll have to ask a follow-up question at some point. So let's talk about that media landscape uh, for just a few minutes and then we'll get and then we'll get to your questions going forward uh, before it, it, once we get to the bottom of the hour. So after this program each week, Jessica and Claire and I get together to decide on the topics for the following Tuesday. And last week we decided that a segment on media polarization, the role that Fox and MSNBC and others play in the nation's political discourse could be an interesting discussion to have. And then the next day, Rush Limbaugh died. Now I'd like to talk about Limbaugh for a couple minutes, not about his political ideology and his brand of conservatism, not whether each of us thought he was right or wrong about the things on which he talked, but rather I'd like to talk to you about how he changed the nature of political media. And I'll give you an example from my own experience. So many, many years ago, back in the mid late nineties, I worked briefly as a host of a political talk show at a Bay Area radio station. And I will tell you with the distance of time, it didn't go all that well. And the reason it didn't go all that well, the station's executive producer he used to get very frustrated with me because she would tell me that I was talking about too many different topics over the course of a three hour program. And she made it very clear to me that I should limit myself to just a very small number of topics. And I still remember her advice. And she told me, she said, Dan, people listen to talk radio 
for the same reason they listen to top 40 radio. They want to hear their favorite hits over and over again. And I thought about her guidance last week after Limbaugh passed away. So Rush Limbaugh was recognized for fundamentally changing the nature of talk radio and he'd utilize the attention getting tricks of a top 40 disc jockey to entertain his audience. And his audience knew what their favorite, knew their favorite topics and they tuned in to hear him play their songs. And they were reassured by the consistency of his message. They knew what they wanted to hear because he played it for them so often. Now that's not meant to be criticism of either, of either Limbaugh or his audience. But by inventing a new type of talk radio, Rush Limbaugh also transformed cable television and online communication and social media as well. In his approach, playing our favorite hits, playing our favorite songs, coming back to our favorite topics, whether on Fox or MSNBC or elsewhere, has been widely mimicked from every place, from every point on the ideological spectrum. Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson use Limbaugh's approach or a slight variation of it. So do Rachel Maddow and Lawrence O'Donnell. So do Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon. Every one of them is preaching to the converted, reassuring the true believers, and mocking the hapless opposition as a motivational tool to remind their audience how much smarter their audience is than the fools on the other side. There's little actual discussion that takes place, and there's no serious effort at persuasion. Instead, what we essentially have on talk radio, on cable, and on much of our online conversation are carnival barkers, warning of the dangers and evils perpetuate, uh, perpetuated by the opposition. Now, this trend toward the extremes has moved from commentary to news. There's a study out last week from Texas A&M University based on more than 46,000 network and cable transcripts. And it found that the producers and anchors of shows on the six major broadcast and cable networks highlight the extremes of both the left and the right much more than those in the center. The middle, where most of the country sits ideolog ide ideologically, gets left out of the conversation altogether because those voices simply aren't booked. Americans therefore are recognizing less and less of themselves on TV because what we're seeing and hearing are voices from the extreme left and the extreme right. And when we see members of Congress on these programs, it's typically portrayed as a, a coven of extremism because we see the outlawing voices, both the most conservative voices on the right and the most progressive voices on the left. Now, the members of Congress in Washington who represent that middle ground, they may or may not be doing a good job, but they make for lousy TV. And the national media covering Washington ends up ignoring them and covering bad behavior and more confrontational behavior from both sides. And that has a trickle down effect to local news consumers. Local newsrooms are half the size they were in 2008. And the result is Americans are getting their information about politics from national outlets, including the broadcast and cable networks. And treating the news like entertainment, well, it has consequences. And it has pushed both sides extremes even further and further away from each other because the nature of national political media is to chase the buzz. And so what we end up with, the result is a political landscape in which most loyalists of the two major parties choose their affiliation not out of belief in the principles and goals of their side's leaders, but because of disdain for the opposition. That's a trend called negative partisanship, and we can talk more about it in the second half of the discussion today if you guys like. But I'd, I'd wrap up by saying this. We can indulge ourselves by wallowing in our favorite Limbaugh imitators from the right or from the left, because they reassure us of our superiority. But the problem is, is that's not designed to be news and information. That's designed to be entertainment. It's designed to be amusement. 
And I think those amusements are designed to be side dishes or desserts, not the main course. So there's no reason not to enjoy the political junk food of cable TV or talk radio after a main course of news and information. The problem arises when Fox or MSNBC becomes a substitute for a reliable news entree rather than a complement to it. If we're going to return the body politic to health, we're going to need to begin with a more nutritious news diet. And like any diet, the self-discipline starts with us. All right, so that turned into a little bit more of a lecture than I normally get into, but I think you all know from turning, tuning into this program regularly how important I think it is to have a conversation that isn't stilted in one direction or the other. Um, but let's open this up. And I'll be eager, as always, to hear your thoughts, either on any of these three topics or anything else that's happened over the past week that you'd like to discuss. So, Jessica, if you're willing to, uh, oh, there you are. Excellent. I'm here. <laughs> so, uh, Kim bet at the outset that we would have lots of questions. How does her bet look? Uh, she was correct. And and uh, yes, a lot of questions actually about the media that came in really quickly, probably the biggest surge of questions I've ever seen. So maybe that's a topic we'll have to revisit in the future. I think um, we should. Yeah, my suggestion, I'm, I'm taking a 90 day break from all media and social media, and I highly recommend it. That's a that's a great way to start a diet if anybody is looking for um, <laughs> Something slightly extreme, just tune into Dan's talk and nothing else. <laughs> I don't think I'm recommending that kind of starvation diet, but an interesting experiment, and we'll need to hear more about it down the line once you've, For sure. once you've concluded. So how are we doing on questions? Sure. Our first question, is all communicated information inherently biased? Has news media created a larger divide amongst Americans? Does it begin with how we educate our children? Boy, three great questions, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll address the last one because I think it's so important. Um, I've talked occasionally on this program before about the horrible job we do in our public schools when it comes to civics education. Most public high schools in California, and most in the country as well, require their students to take one single semester of civics before they graduate. 15 weeks that's actually civics and government and geography all crammed in to one crash course that's offered in 11th through 12th grade. And I worry greatly, and it sounds like the questioner does too, I worry greatly that the unspoken message to young people is that this politics stuff, this government stuff, this democracy stuff is so unimportant, we're not going to bother teaching it to you for your first 10 years of school. And then we're going to give you this quick crash course and then send you out 18 months later and hope that you're a responsible citizen and a reliable voter. And that's just not good enough. I think human nature being what it is, is it is only natural for us to want to be flattered, being told by people who agree with us how smart we are for agreeing with them, whether it's Matt or Hannity or anyone in between. But it does require a self-discipline to be able to say, I'm going to have a side dish. I'm going to have dessert from my side of the aisle. But I'm going to listen to what people on the other side have to say as well, not necessarily because it's going to change my mind, but maybe it'll open it a little bit. We have a lot of questions from people asking, where do we go for neutral news? How, where can we go for nutritious news? Um, I don't know if you have any suggestions for them. Well, whenever anyone asks, this question. I always ask a question in return. So anyone who sent in that question or a variation of it, and it's a smart one, I'm going to ask you a question back. My question is this, who is your magic friend? Who is the one person in your life, your spouse, another family member, a neighbor, a coworker? Who is that one person who, when they recommend something, no matter what, you automatically do it? When they recommend a restaurant, remember when we used to go to restaurants? When they recommend a restaurant, you automatically go there. When they recommend a movie, you go see it or you download it no matter what. Clothes, cars, whatever it happens to be, if that person says it, we do it. Now, of course, the answer is none of us have a magic friend. What we do is we rely on a range of sources for input before we come to these decisions. Some of my friends will suggest a vacation to this location. Some will suggest a vacation in another location. 
Some will encourage, uh, encourage me to try a particular restaurant. Others will say they didn't like it that much. And so I take in a wide range of opinion and insight before coming to my own conclusion. And so my argument is just like we don't have a magic friend when it comes to clothes or food or movies or music or, what, or vacations or whatever it happens to be, we shouldn't assume that there's a magic news source too that will present us with everything we need. And just like we reach out to a variety of sources for input and advice and perspective, when we make all the other decisions in our life, maybe the best thing to do is to adopt the same approach when it comes to news and make an effort to reach out to those sources, not only those with whom we're inclined to agree, but at least some of the time to those with whom we disagree also. And we can make just as informed a decision on current events, on politics, on government and public policy, as we do on the other things in our life in which we reach out to a range of sources. How much did the revocation of the FCC Fairness Doctrine in 1987 lead to the rise of far right and far left talk radio and cable news? Well, there's no question uh, that the revocation of the Fairness Doctrine back in the 80s directly led to an influx of talk radio, of conservative talk radio commentators, Limbaugh, most among them. But over the years, I don't think that the absence of the Fairness Doctrine has had nearly the same type of effect as uh, its supporters would argue. And the reason for that is because we live in an era in which a range of opinions and ideas and perspectives and ideologies are available to us every day, all day, online. And so while a small number, relatively small number, of conservative talk radio hosts took over an underused AM radio dial back in the late 20th century, today, when that information, when those opinions are available to us online from across the spectrum, I don't know that the lack of the doctrine has as much of an effect as it, as it once did. There is no perspective from the far left to the far right that you can't get online. And so while the Fairness Doctrine may have made sense in a pre-internet era, today I don't know that it's as relevant as it might have been in the past. Do you think the pandemic affected the polarization of TV watching? Well, that's an excellent question. We'd seen an acceleration in polarization of media consumption for many, many years. But it's a fascinating question whether the pandemic accelerated it. And I suspect that it did. If for no other reason, then most of us became much heavier media consumers over the course of the last 11 months because we were spending a lot more time in our homes than we had previously. You know, any number of people wonder out loud and with understandable regret why taking on such a menacing pandemic became such a polarizing and partisan issue. Um, and in fact, we heard this week from some of the nation's leading health experts, they believe that many people died as a direct result of how polarized the discussion over COVID had become. But I do believe, and I had not thought about it previously, but I do believe uh, that the questioner's uh, point is a valid one. And that even while for many years we've been seeing that polarization increase, just the sheer volume of media consumption in all of our lives compared to just 12 or 13 months ago, probably has accelerated uh, the polarization uh, that, the, uh, that, that the media adds to, to, to the types of discussions we have. Really good question. This questioner says, I'm concerned that the New York Times reporters are voicing opinions in news articles, whereas earlier opinions were reserved for the editorial page. Is this a problem in your mind? Well, um, it is a problem, but it's an understandable problem, and it's certainly not one that's limited to the New York Times. Uh, the challenge that a traditional newspaper faces in the internet era and the social media era is unfathomable, at least today, to, to, to today, it's been an unsolvable problem. No pr pr traditional print uh, news outlet, with the possible exception of the Times, has been able to figure out a way to flourish in an internet era when so much news and information is online at all times. Now, I know some of you on this uh, program, like me, 
grew up in an era where unless we happened to catch a news update on the radio during the day, we simply weren't exposed to news between the time we got our paper in the morning and watched the evening news at night. And by the time we woke up the next morning, the, surface, the, the service that the daily newspaper provided was a summary of all the news over the last tw previous 24 hours. Now, most of us don't need that summary anymore, at least not as badly as we do, because a great deal of the news that is uh, important enough to be on the front page of the New York Times or the LA Times or the Sacramento Bee or the Milwaukee Journal is something we've already heard about over the course of the day. So what do these newspapers do? Well, they can't just provide news anymore because we've already gotten news by the, you know, by the, by the time it becomes available to us. So what do they do? They provide analysis. And when it's done well, that analysis is perspective. It's offering us a broader view that we might not guess when, get when the news comes, comes rushing in. Um, at its worst, that analysis uh, devolves into opinion. And I think what the questioner is raising is a serious concern, which is how does a reputable news outlet, on one hand, encourage their reporters to provide analysis and broader perspective of breaking news while, not, um, while drawing a line from them expressing their very specific opinions. Now, there's a growing school of thought uh, among professional journalists that journalists should be able to express their personal opinions, not just uh, in life, but in the pages or on the website of their news organization, because they believe that those opinions are a valid part of the discourse. I'm old fashioned enough to think that news should be on one side of that wall and opinion should be on the other, but the need to add analysis to the news product in order to make it a worthwhile product does blur that line. And it's one that I don't think either the New York Times or the LA Times or any other daily paper in the country has figured out an ironclad solution to yet. All right, we're gonna pivot back a little bit to uh, the earlier topic. Are you surprised by Joe Manchin's rejection of Neera Tandon for OMB head? Do you think this dooms her nomination? Doesn't his and various GOP senators' objections seem petty for the deeds that, it, that she is tagged with uh, and the four years we've just been through? Well, you know, Senator Manchin and a number of Republicans have criticized Neera Tandon for some very harsh and very nasty tweets and other types of public comments that she's made over the years. Now, as any number of people have pointed out, at least those Republicans, less so Manchin, were able to look past Donald Trump's invective over the course of the last four years. But Manchin makes a point that whether you agree with or not, I think deserves to be taken seriously. And you may decide to reject it, but that doesn't mean it's not worth considering. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, Manchin does, said if, the, if President Biden is looking to reestablish a bipartisan spirit of unity in Washington and in the country, having someone in such a high profile position who has such a visible record of vitriolic and confrontational language undermines his efforts toward that goal rather than supports it. And Manchin is simply saying, again, whether you agree with him or not, can't we find someone who's capable enough to oversee the federal budget process who doesn't have a long record of very partisan uh, uh, aggressiveness? Um, different people are going to come to different conclusions about whether that's legit or not. Some smart people have pointed out that uh, Tandon is a woman and as a woman of color are facing stronger criticism on this front than male nominees of both parties have in the past. Uh, but regardless of whether you think she should be confirmed or not, it's looking very unlikely at this point. Uh, Susan Collins and Mitt Romney uh, two of the most likely Republican senators to cross party lines on nominations. They both said that they will oppose Tandon for the same reason that Manchin has. Uh, Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska, appears to be Tandon's best hope at this point. But it doesn't look like much of a hope because we're already hearing chatter out of Democrats in Congress about the individual who they'd like to be o o uh, OMB director if Tandon doesn't make it. And once you start hearing that kind of gossip, that 
means that the nominee's chances are shrinking pretty precipitously. Thank you. And one of our audience members also mentioned that uh, Senator Sanders had also criticized Mira Tandon. So coming from all sides. Very good point. Is there any pro is there any prospect for increasing taxes or eliminating certain tax cuts in Biden's broader economic plan? Uh, and, and the answer to both of those questions is yes. And Janet Yellen, his, uh, Treasury, his new tre uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, talked about this yesterday, that she believed, and speaking on behalf of the president, that he believed that raising the corporate tax might be a potential source of revenue to pay for some of the Build Back Better programming he was talking about. Um, it appears that they're not going to pursue um, the type of wealth tax that Senator Elizabeth Warren and others have talked about in the past. But while they may attempt to repeal some of the Trump tax cuts on some of the higher earners, it looks more that they'll be looking at the business community for revenue rather than wealthy individuals and looking for a way to offset those tax cuts by providing opportunities in a Build Back Better economic and infrastructure legislation. So uh, he and his representatives have made it clear that while they don't want to raise taxes on the middle class and think that a wealth, wealth tax would be just difficult to administer, uh, it does appear that they're opening proffer uh, to accompany the Build Back Better legislation next month will include an increase in at least some types of corporate taxes. With moving toward automation, do you think there will be more talk about universal basic income? Andrew Yang talked about the future of this due to automation. Um, I do think there'll be more talk about it. I'm not knowledgeable enough on the issue to know whether it is workable or not. Um, but when Yang talked about a universal basic income in last year's presidential campaign, it came across very much as he came across very much as an ideological outlier. Like one of the things that we're going to have to figure out as a society, whether it's that solution or another, is what do you do with large numbers of people whose jobs simply no longer exist, either as a result of automation, like in factory workers, but also in the retail and in the service sectors, just the way our lives are all going to change um, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, there's been increasing talk not just among Democrats, uh, but in the Republican Party, um, about increasing the tax credit for children. And so the idea is less to write a check for everyone, but to use government compensation as an incentive for increased, uh, for increased family size. Public opinion polls show that many Americans would like to have more children and don't think that they can afford to. Uh, we're also seeing the prospect of population leveling, if not decrease, of the type that's taken place in Japan and in Western Europe. And so those who are pushing for the children's tax credit are not arguing quite as expansively as Yang with universal basic income, but thinking about ways to provide financial support on a much broader level than has traditionally been the case. So again, I don't know if that's the answer or not, but if you do have a large sector of the workplace being forced to find something else to do to make a living in such short order. Uh, uh, there's going to need to be some option, if not that one, but of similar scope. This next questioner says, um, and I, I'm going to correct it a little bit, why is President Biden so obstinate about student debt relief? What are the major differences between Warren and Bernie Sanders' position of student debt relief versus the beliefs of President Biden? So there's two differences. Uh, the most visible is the amount of debt relief that the government ought to provide. Um, Warren and Sanders and others on the more progressive side of the Democratic Party have argued that debt relief of up to $50,000 per individual is something that they think would not only be fair to those uh, students, former students facing debt, but also provide a boost to the economy. Biden agrees with them philosophically, but he believes that a $10,000 uh, limit as opposed to a $50,000 compensation would be more appropriate. That's the kind of thing that can be negotiated and settled. The trickier question, I think this is one that's going to hang up this, uh, complicate this debate going forward, 
is not so much how, not really how much debt relief should be offered, but to whom. And what Biden has talked about in the past is how those from wealthier circumstances, either because they grew up in a wealthy family or because of the financial successes that they've achieved since leaving higher education, that they should not be uh, given the same kind of relief that working class Americans are. So the 10,000 versus 50,000 argument is the one that's attracted the most attention so far. But where this gets really complicated is on the question of how do you means test uh, this, this debt relief? Does everyone get it or only those whose incomes or assets um, are at or below a certain level? Can you help explain what we can expect with school reopenings? It seems like the CDC is saying one thing, President Biden is saying something else, and then his press secretary has a different point of view. How can parents, teachers, and students sort out their academic year with such confusing information out there? Yeah, th this might be the greatest or the, the most complicated policy challenge that Biden is facing. And it's certainly, it's already become the single most complicated policy challenge that California's governor, Gavin Newsom, is facing here at home. Uh, the CDC uh, and other health experts believe that with proper precautions, masks, social distancing, uh, air circulation, and, and so on, that schools can reopen. Um, Biden, for the most part, agrees with that, but he works very, very hard to emphasize what a priority it is for him to get vaccinations to teachers. Um, the teachers unions, both at the national and the state level, have said that they don't believe that their members ought to go back to work until they've all been vaccinated. So what Biden is trying to do is get enough vaccines out the door quickly enough so that becomes reconcilable. Um, from pure health reasons, um, the, the CDC and others argue that other essential workers have returned to the workplace even before getting vaccinated. And if teachers take similar precautions, they should be able to too. Um, Biden has been a stalwart ally, ally of organized labor. He's probably been the first true ally of the teachers unions in the White House since Jimmy Carter in the late 1970s. And he recognizes both that this is a critically important part of his political base, but it's also something that he, that, that he rec recognizes from his own involvement with them. And of course, Dr. Biden's uh, uh, history as a, as a teacher as well. Um, the challenge for Democratic politicians, whether Biden or Newsom, is how do you navigate between two constituencies that are part of your traditional political base. On one hand, you have not just teachers, but teachers unions. On the other hand, you have not just parents, but particularly parents from minority and other represented communities whose children are bearing the brunt of the damage caused by distance learning. Um, if Biden can enough get enough vaccines out the door fast enough, he'll be able to square the circle. If not, it's a horrible political problem for him and even a more horrible real world problem for parents and their children who are still learning online instead of in person. The best guess at this point is while there may be some in-person learning later this spring, there will almost certainly be sustained uh, summer uh, school for most K through 12 students to make up for what was lost or for to make up for a portion of what was lost. But it's probably not gonna be until the beginning of the next school year in August that we really do have a return, a relatively assured turn, uh, return to normal. Up until then, I'm afraid the type of uncertainty that the questioner asks about is going to be part and parcel of the discussion, and we'll muck our way through it the best we can. Does Biden's re-engagement with Europe mean we will no longer insist that NATO members have to live up to 2% of gross national product on defense spending, and the U.S. continues to provide 80% of cost for NATO? Um, it does not. Uh, Secretary of Defense Austin made it very clear in his trip to uh, meet with the NATO leaders last week uh, that the Biden administration does expect uh, the, uh, the European countries uh, to meet their obligations. Uh, that said, even given the much greater amount of pressure that the Trump administration put on them, 
Many European, many European countries simply have not. Uh, they've either agreed to and sort of dragged their feet on it or have offered reasons why it's not necessary or appropriate for them to do so. So it does not appear that the Biden administration is backing away at all uh, from the pressure that uh, tr the Trump's uh, people put on the other NATO members to live up to their financial commitments. It's not clear yet whether Biden will be more successful in getting them to come through with that additional money than Trump was. Can you comment on Biden's remarks at the CNN town hall uh, where he said he won't speak out against what China's President Xi has done in Hong Kong or towards Taiwan, as well as the horrific treatment of the Uyghurs? Well, I, I have to admit, uh, while I did not watch the town hall, I read about it. And while I, from what I read, Biden was somewhat cautious in what he said about uh, China's record and actions on human rights, I have to admit I did not read or see him saying that he would not do anything about it. And if that's the case, then I apologize because I just missed it. But what I will note, as I mentioned a little bit earlier today, is just this morning, the Biden administration uh, announced several steps relating to China's treatment of Hong Kong. And outside that town hall, Biden and his appointees have been pretty clear that they believe that not just with Hong Kong, but with Taiwan and this horrific actions in Northwest China, that those are the types of things that the U.S. wants to address. As I talked about earlier, is relying on Europe and other traditional allies to help us address those challenges more effectively. So if I missed a statement in in the town hall meeting, that's on me. But if Biden did say that, it's not consistent with the other things that he and his appointees have been saying since taking office. Um, I know we're almost at the end of the hour, so, and I know um, this is a California topic, but can you update the status of the Newsom recall? Sure. Last week, uh, the Secretary of State's office announced an update to the signature gathering that would put the recall on the ballot. It appears at this point that while the proponents of a recall have another month to collect signatures and to have them verified, if those signatures continue to be verified at the rate that has been the case so far, that it looks at this point very, very likely that the recall will, of Newsom will qualify for the ballot. Right now, only about half of the signatures necessary have been confirmed as valid, but between those that have been confirmed those that have been handed in but haven't been counted yet, and the fact that there's another month to go, means that you'd have to see a very abrupt change of course for the necessary number of signatures not to be collected. The question then becomes if the recall does qualify, when it would take place. We don't have a good answer to that, and the reason we don't have a good answer to that is a conversation for another day, but the short version is, is the recall, if it does qualify, could take place as early as late summer or early fall, but there's actually machinations that if they so chose uh, that the Democrats could take to delay the recall into 2022 uh, to merge it with the next statewide election, the 2022 primary, in hopes that a heavier and more Democratic turnout would work more in Newsom's favor. So it does look like very likely, though not certain, that the recall is going to qualify at this point. The next question is when the election will be held. Uh, well, Dan, thank you so much. I know we're near the end of the hour. Uh, for any of you guys who have missed any of Dan's past talks, we have a YouTube channel and you can watch his talks there. So you can become a fan of independent YouTube news analysts like Dan uh, going forward. And thank you so much, Kim. I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for managing our questions so well. Dan, we are so fortunate to have your weekly guidance and expertise for our own very personal civic engagement discussions. So thank you so much for your time. You, uh, I think, reduce everybody's blood pressure <laughs> weekly. So we can't wait to have you come back next Tuesday. So thank you so much. Uh, we are hoping at the World Affairs Council Town Hall to start bringing back in-person events to coordinate with these ongoing live streams in the fall. But until then, we've got a bevy of terrific live streams 
uh, for you, all lined up, all free as a public service. So when you can, please uh, text the name Schnur to the number that Claire will be putting on the screen in a few minutes. Uh, we would really appreciate your support. We have some terrific upcoming uh, programs. This week, tomorrow, we have a program on the 10th anniversary, an anniversary of the Arab Spring, looking back and looking forward. Next week, a conversation with India's ambassador to the United States. On, on March 5th, a film screening, Stray, which is an in, um, Istanbul story. And on the 10th, protest and repression around the globe, a roundtable discussion on Hong Kong, Thailand, Russia, and, and other key areas. So please go to our website at lawacth.org, register today for the programs, become a member, make a donation. Dan, we can't wait till next Tuesday. <laughs> Really looking forward to you, Kim, and thanks to all of you for such really interesting questions. As always, we we appreciate it and look forward to next week's too.